Hi there, I'm Vinny Caggiano, and um, this playlist, Fragments of Infinity, is based on a book I'm writing about music theory. It's uh, incomplete in that it's not entirely edited yet, but the sequence is there, and I'm going to be following the sequence of uh, my book through these lectures. Um, right now, what I'd like to do is uh, give you an overview of what I'm going to be uh, working with over the course of this series. First of all, first thing I want to talk about is, is the fact that the academic world does not have things 100% correct. Uh, in fact, they're missing huge pieces in what they're teaching in music school today. This is based on discoveries I've made over years and years of teaching. Um, so, basically, I bet you thought that there's one music theory. Well, in fact, there are three different music theories. And how can this be? Around the turn of the century, uh, when the Industrial Revolution happened, two important uh, trends began to happen. One was with the European Impressionist composers and uh, classical composers, that they dug up the old Greek modes and brought them back into, into the world of music and started using these modes liberally. The second thing was these Europeans were also listening closely to that American music form called jazz. Um, jazz was based on the blues, all right? So what I am proposing here is that there are three different music theories. Um, let's look at the first one. The first would be the seven Greek modes were basically the do, re, mi scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, where a different mode is if you started on re of the scale, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, re, okay, that sort of thing. So with each step of the scale, there are seven different modes that are rooted in that beginning note. Um, the thing about this was, though, in ancient times, there was no temperament of the scale. Now, a lot of people get confused about temperament. Tell the truth, even I am a little bit. I'm still trying to geek out the mathematics of it. But basically, uh, Pythagoras came along and he codified what we call the Western scale today, uh, the diatonic scale. Um, he did it through a series of scientific experiments. He took a metal bar, cut it in half, and noticed that it was an octave higher when he cut the bar in half. If he clanged the bar before he cut it, it'd be an octave lower than when he cut it in half. Boom, it's an octave higher. So if you cut a third off of the bar, what you get is the interval called a perfect fifth. So when he found this fifth, he created more and more and more fifths, distances of fifths. What that does is eventually cycles around to give us all 12 notes of our system. It also gives us the music, musical scale, which by the way, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do in its purest form is a natural phenomenon. All right, uh, that's basically how Pythagoras found all the, our scale, is that it occurs in nature. Um, I like to say that within at least this solar system, as far as I know, all objects, all physical objects, are embedded with the seven notes do, re, mi, so, uh, do, re, mi fa, sol, la, ti, do. Um, if you take a bottle or a conch shell and blow into it, you'll hear various notes, and if you get good at it, you'd be able to actually do the entire scale with that conch shell or that bottle. Um, you could bang on logs. If you cut logs of different sizes, you notice a, it's a dense tone, but there is a tone there. There is a note there, all right? And in fact, some notes are so low frequency, we just simply can't hear them. But basically, all physical objects in this world we live in have uh, music embedded in them. I like to call music the hidden mathematics of nature. And when you look at the Buddhist Hindu uh, chakras, the seven chakra system, you see there are seven points in the human body that are considered gravity points and very important points uh, for the psychology of a human being. Well, there's seven of them. Perhaps there's a connection between that and the seven notes of the do, re, mi scale. Um, anyway, there are these three music theories, all right? The first one is what I call isolated keys. This is the seven Greek modes. Just think of it as one scale, though. Don't think of it as seven. Just think of it as do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, okay? There is that scale. Now, if I build that scale in C and I make an instrument that could play that scale in C, all right, that 
that instrument could only play C. If I made an instrument that could only play the key of D, that instrument could only play D. And that's actually the way things were. You could not have an instrument play the many keys, all right? The problem was that if, if I tuned my whatever instrument it is to the key of C, all the other uh, keys would gradually, as you go around the circle of fifths, get more and more and more out of tune. What this means is I can't borrow a chord from a different key. All right, what this means is I can't borrow notes from different keys. Now, if you know anything about music in our modern world, we borrow notes from all the different keys all the time. All right, so what happened? The pre-tempered uh, pre scale, think of it like this. There are 12 different, ma what they call major keys, all right, and none of those keys were able to interact with each other, okay? You either played a piece in the key of C or the key of G, but never the two will meet in the same piece of music. Unless, of course, you change instruments that are tuned to those keys, which is pretty cumbersome. All right, now, along, um, along the lines of history, we go to the day of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. The guy was a genius beyond comparison. And uh, he participated in a town called Jena in Germany. He participated in... Um, it was kind of a contest, and basically the idea here was how are we going to slightly tweak the notes of our system so that all 12 keys can interact with each other, okay? Look at it this way, the semitones of the chromatic scale, C to C sharp to D to, to D sharp to E, right? If I go C to C sharp, there's a certain uh, wavelength ratio that's happening between those two notes. If I go to C sharp to D, there's another wavelength ratio. Now the thing is, the ratios were different from note to note to note. And there, that was one of the reasons why we couldn't interact the keys. So basically, um, what we're listening to today and what we have is the tempered scale and it's slightly out of tune. What they did is they evened the distances between all the 12 semitones, which would be uh, what we call today um, equal temperament. Wow, brain fart there. Equal temperament. Um, so now, in this sense, we can now combine keys together and have them play off of each other, but the addition of notes and chords from different keys were kind of modular. In other words, if I'm in the key of G and I go B7 to E minor, just and then I go A minor D7, all right, B7 to E minor is a very slight, temporarily modular moment of the key of E minor. But then A minor D7 brings us back to G. So they're separate, but you could put them in the same piece. So what you could say, the way you could put this is the keys are interacting with each other. So the second level, the second type of music theory, European major minor key system, I like to refer to as interactive keys. All right, so the first system, keys can't interact. Second system, Keys can interact uh, in modular units and pieces. The third system, which is an American system, and it was basically birthed from the blues, is what I call key blending. All right, this is not just key modular units now. We're actually mixing two keys together at once. And that would, uh, the way I describe that, or the way you can see it, is that basically in a blues, you have what's called a seventh chord and uh, which is close to being a major chord, it just has an extra little note in it that makes it seventh. Point being though, you're playing a minor scale against a major chord. This would never have been done in classical days. Prior to the blues, this was never ever done. The classical guys wouldn't even think of it, like play a minor scale against a major chord, that, they wouldn't even think of it. So keep that in mind, all right, that um, what we have with the blues is actually a new music theory, a third music theory, and I call this key blending. All right, now don't take the blues lightly. Academia loves to snub what they call lower forms of music, such as folk music and uh, traditional songs and things like that, and blues is in that category. Blues originally was folk music, all right, but a different type altogether than you'd get in, say, the Appalachians before the black influence. Okay, so, um, there are three different music theories. Now, point being, right now, we are talking from one of them. In our modern times, we only talk from one of these systems, and that's the major minor key system. 
but since the modes and the blues were brought into things, all right, they're trying to explain blues or trying to explain the modes from the perspective of a major minor key system. And what that's equivalent to doing is using an algebraic formula to try to cook dinner, okay? It doesn't make sense. So what I, my job here is to clarify the three different systems and hopefully one day an academic will come along and find a way to blend these systems that we could talk about them and they make sense. Because the, the way things are right now, if you're in the laws, within the laws of the Greek modes, the laws will make sense within the Greek modes. But when you transfer those ideas to the major minor key system, those laws don't make sense anymore. And vice versa, okay? One of the m really important things, and I think is a major screw up in the major minor key system, is the fact that a key and a root are the same thing. In the Greek mode system, a key was simply a collection of notes, neutral. You could take one of those notes and make it a root. So I could have the key of C, but I can have a D note as a root, creating what's called the Dorian scale. All right. In the major minor key system, what they're doing here is they're saying that I'm in the key of C, therefore C is the root. See the difference? In the mode system, C, D, E, F, G, A, B could be roots. In the major minor key system, if I'm in the key of C, C is the root and there's no other roots unless I change keys. This to me was a huge mistake. They could have thought it out a little bit more as far as I'm concerned anyway. So we have three systems that I'm going to clarify. Now, uh, I'd like to talk about the three dimensions of music, respectively rhythm, melody, and harmony, uh, and how it affects the human psyche. All right, Rhythm, heavily rhythmic music will incite the body to dance. Rhythm makes you, your body want to move. The body responds to it. Okay. Uh, melody is an emotional phenomenon. It's centered here. Okay. Emotions, you sing your heart out. That's, that's melody. Um, Harmony, especially after temperament, when temperament happened, a great amount of complexi complexity was added to the understanding of music and music theory. Uh, so when you hear musicians talking like quantum physicists, this is the tritone substitution of the 5705. That is talking about harmony. Harmony is an intellectual function. So we have physical uh, rhythm, emotional melody, mental, we have uh, harmony, the study of harmony. Those three put together and working together create the whole spiritual experience of music. All right. But there is a fourth dimension to music, believe it or not, at least as I've observed, and that would be texture. How I describe texture is if you had um, a flute play a melody, and then you had a piano play the same melody, then you had a tuba play that melody, and then you had a violin play that melody, all four of those instruments have different colors and expression. They have different textures. So texture is actually the color quality of the sound. All right. Uh, some great composers who uh, worked with texture would be uh, like Maurice Ravel would be one of them. Igor Stravinsky uh, stretched the whole concept of texture. Um, so on and so forth. So. Uh, Now, texture is all fine and good, I mean, but the point being that you create a composition and then you make texture, you decide what instruments are going to play the various parts and melodies and harmonies, all right? When you focus on solely texture to the detriment of rhythm, melody, and harmony, you can't polish a turd. It ain't going to work. If, in other words, you have to have a good, firm basis of composition before you colorize that composition, okay? If you think of a coloring book, if you have a bad drawing in there and you color it in, it's still going to look bad, all right? So um, that's probably one of the qualms I have with EDM, modern electronic dance music, is that the composers are really getting into, wow, this is a really cool sound I'm getting from my computer, virtual instruments that never existed before. <clears throat> when this first started happening, even I was excited. That, that was a cool prospect. However, I think a lot of the EADM composers are, are pretty lazy about what their, their chord progressions and what's going on. Secondly, the fact they have completely eliminated the blues element from uh, music. Now, 
an American EDM composer should be concerned about that because blues is a uniquely American music and I want to encourage people to preserve that sound of the blues. It can be modernized, it doesn't necessarily have to sound old school. In fact, I heard an EDM composition that had blues and gospel influence and it sounded modern, it sounded cool. All right, so um, I wanna talk about the three chord types. All right. I like to simplify things as much as possible. You know, you could look in a chord dictionary and there's a gazillion of them, but there's only three chords when you boil it down, major, minor, and seventh. Before I go on, all right, I'm sure there are people that will argue with me about this. There are plenty, no shortage of those people around. But any principle in music theory is about 80% true. And there, the other 20% comes along to negate that truth. That's just the way things are in music. Music is an asymmetrical system, and therefore you're going to have asymmetric, asymmetry in its rules. All right, so um, the three chord types, major, minor, and dominant seventh, however, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, I think those exceptions are actually so tense that they relate to the seventh chord themselves. I'll get into that in the future. But when you think about a major chord, you're taught in elementary school, major is happy and minor is sad, but they don't teach you about seventh. Major is happy, content, the sun is shining, everything's nice. Minor is sad, somber, and very serious. Seventh is bittersweet, it's anxious, it wants to move, all right? Now, when we look at history, in a sense you could say that the original Greek modes were major based in the sense that if I have the key of C and no other interactive keys, the G7 chord I build in C will bring me back to that C major chord. All right. If we go to the major minor key system, you could say this is a minor based system. And the reason why is when temperament occurred, they began to separate this idea there are major keys and minor keys. So they created these uh, so-called minor keys. Um, this is based, these minor keys were based off the sixth step. Uh, the sixth step of any major scale is the Aeolian step. And they tweaked this Aeolian scale. At one point they raised the seventh, and at one point they also raised the sixth along with the seventh. This created immense complexity in music, this one little move alone. All right, so you could say in a sense it, the evolution of the minor keys, that the major minor key system was about the evolution of these minor keys. Because uh, not much else was done with the major keys. And then finally, in modern times, you can say our modern music is seventh chord based, dominant chord based. What came, basically, when you look at classical music, the seventh chord had one function and one function only. That is to resolve somewhere, if I might demonstrate. Here's a G7 chord resolving to C. You can hear the, the weight, the gravity of the C chord that the G7 just wants to go there. So the seventh chord in the European sense wants to go somewhere. You can't have it as an ending chord of a piece of music because you'd leave you hanging. Um, and it never goes. Right, so that was the notion back in those days. Now, when we go to American history, we talk about the um, black slaves, all right? They brought in from Mali the original form of the blues, but for the first time now, these people are hearing tempered music. When you think of the cotton plantation, there's the, the, uh, the main mansion where the rich white people lived, and back in those days, everybody was taught to play piano. So they're sitting there playing Stephen Foster songs, and here are these Africans listening to this going, whoa, harmony, chord movement, this is different. Because African music really wasn't based on much chord movement at the time, especially. It was basically drums and pentatonic scales in certain kinds of harmony with each other, but not strictly chord movement. Okay, now these guys are hearing chord movement, they're going, cool. So they build their own little cigar box banjos and guitars, and since they don't know the rules of European music, they naively, in a sense, made up their own. And one of the rules they made up is 
yes, you can end on a seventh chord, and it will sound complete. Now, that same seventh chord that resolved to C in the European sense, when we put it at that G7 in a blues context, let me do a blues turnaround. And there we are ending on a seventh chord. Suddenly, this is allowed. That move alone changed everything. There are two things that, that created a blues theory and a revolutionary change in music altogether. One of them is the seventh chord as root, and another one is the minor pentatonic against that seventh chord. All right? I'll get into deeper detail with that. And there's a lot of other points about the blues, but those are really important ones right there. Okay, so I'm going to take a break here, and we'll move on with this uh, overview in the next uh, segment. Okay, thanks so much for checking it out. Uh, good night, YouTubers, or good day, wherever part of the world you're from. Have a good one.